Hello, welcome to Ask an Atheist on Facebook Live, produced by the Freedom From Religion Foundation. I'm Dan Barker. I'm co-president with Annie Laurie of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. And on today's show, we're going to talk about Alito's true colors. Um, and with us uh, to talk from a legal point of view is our attorney, our legal counsel with FFRF, Sam Grover. Hi, it's uh, great to be here with you, Dan and Annie Laurie, to talk about uh, Justice Alito uh, and his recent talk um, where he uh, lambasts non-believers as, uh, as being uh, antithetical to religious freedom. Yes, it was a very concerning speech. And so on today's show, we're going to parse uh, what Alito said. Uh, it was before a Notre Dame... Um, so-called Religious conference Freedom religious, Conference in yeah, Rome. In Rome. And we did issue a press release about it, and people may have read some of the news stories, but we think it's important to show what he's saying about nonbelievers, also the way he brags about denying women abortion rights uh, at this event. And But uh, first, we should tell viewers, if you have a comment you want to make, or if you have a question you want to ask, you can do it right there in the Facebook comments. Or uh, you can send an email to askanatheist at ffrf.org. Yeah, and we'll try to get to your comments or questions after we go through this very unpleasant um, clips, clips of Alito being very unpleasant at, at this conference. And I think that we could start with, we have one clip now. But in those places, religious liberty is facing a different challenge and Professor Glendon has referred to that. This challenge stems from a turn away from religion. Polls show a significant increase in the percentage of the population that rejects religion or thinks it's just not all that important. And this has a very important impact on religious liberty because it is hard to convince people that religious liberty is worth defending if they don't think that religion is a good thing that deserves protection. So, Wowser, <laughs> I'm guilty before being, you know, we're um, guilty before being found, we're supposed to be innocent before being found guilty, <laughs> and Alito is convicting non-believers of not believing in religious liberty. And, of course, my first reaction is that most atheists, agnostics, certainly the Freedom From Religion Foundation, we are purists when it comes to protecting religious liberty because we know that when religion gets behind government and there's persecution, non-believers are going to be the, the most affected. But uh, what reaction did you have? Well, yeah, um, certainly uh, non-believers are beneficiaries of actual religious freedom, which is the, the, the right of conscience, uh, right? The freedom to believe or not believe whatever you want and not have the government uh, dictate that for you or to withhold the benefits of being a citizen uh, based on your belief or lack thereof. Uh, so uh, the idea that we're somehow uh, enemies of religious freedom is simply not true, um, though we may be enemies of uh, the quote unquote religious freedom that Justice Alito is actually talking about, where uh, that's just coded language. Uh, for uh, giving uh, a certain segment of Christians, the evangelical Christians on the religious right, the opportunity to discriminate uh, against uh, minority groups. Yeah, in other words, he's, he's redefining the idea of religious freedom or religious liberty to be something that privileges those who are religious and the same rules don't apply to them that ap apply to everyone else. They can discriminate if they have a sincerely held religious belief that they don't like you if you're gay, for example, right? right? Well, Dan, but, uh, what was your on, reaction? On the other hand, uh, it shows that Alito's paying attention. He knows, and our briefs have pointed this out a lot to the Supreme Court on many of these issues, that the country is getting less religious. And that seems to bother him. He sees it. He knows it. He knows religion is declining. He knows we non-believers, we nuns are increasing. And isn't a democratic society supposed to be democratic? Shouldn't he be saying, well, look what's happening to democracy, our country becoming, so let's, let's honor that. Instead, he's maligning us, isn't he? He is, yeah. Uh, you, you can tell that it uh, 
sort of weighs on his conscience that mm. uh, the the country is becoming more secular that um, that people are finding that they can be good without God, uh, for instance. Well, also, does he think that? Also, does he also, believe I that? I mean, what, what's so distressing, alarming, is that uh, a U.S. Supreme Court justice that's there to interpret the Constitution doesn't seem to realize we have a godless and entirely secular Constitution that says there's no religious test for public office, etc. So how can there be a religious test for citizenship? And yet that that is the issue that, as non-believers, we often confront this sort of implication, this implied idea that you're not really patriotic, or you're not a true citizen if you're not religious, you're an outsider. So he's buying into that. Yeah. That Definitely. religion is a good thing. Obviously, he thinks religion is a good thing. Well, he can think that, but then he shouldn't be um, saying it's bad to be non-religious. I mean, he's equating the two. Well, let's look at the next clip. I'm reminded of an experience I had a number of years ago in a museum in, um, in Berlin. Uh, one of the exhibits was a rustic wooden cross. A young, uh, a, a, an affluent woman, a, a well-dressed woman and a young boy were looking at this exhibit and the young boy turned to the woman, presumably his mother, and said, who is that man? That memory has stuck in my mind as a harbinger of what may lie ahead for our culture. And the problem that looms is not just indifference to religion. It's not just ignorance about religion. There's also growing hostility to religion, or at least to traditional religious beliefs that are contrary to the new moral code that is ascendant in some sectors. The challenge for those who want to protect religious liberty in the United States, Europe, and other similar places is to convince people who are not religious that religious liberty is worth special protection. And that will not be easy to do. <laughs> so there again, uh, the enemies of religious liberty are the non-religious. Um, and again, he has to be redefining religious liberty because we know that's not true. We know that much, most, almost all of the Establishment Clause cases were taken either by non-believers or by religious minorities, such as Jehovah Witnesses. Right. And when Alito uh, is talking about the challenge of uh, preserving religious liberty here, uh, he's talking about uh, this pushback to the increased rights that uh, minority groups are receiving in this country, uh, LGBTQ uh, plus individuals, uh, and uh, I mean, e even uh, women, and uh, when it comes to abortion access, certainly, uh, these are um, at odds with the religious liberty that he sees as being uh, important in the country, which is the right to discriminate and the right to impose religious beliefs on other people. Your religious beliefs, your Catholic beliefs, in the case of six out of the three, six out of the nine justices who voted for Dobbs were raised Catholic. Right. And, um, you know, and they're conservative extremist Roman Catholics. So, Dan. So, the, the context of that remark that he just made, starting off with that story about this kid in a museum, Alito being shocked that a child would not know something about the crucifix or about Christianity, you know? I mean, wh what if he was looking at a, I don't know, a Buddhist wheel or something, and the kid said, what is that, Mom? Would Alito be just as shocked? He's really talking about the so-called Judeo-Christian founding that he thinks started our country. So in that context, what, is, what does religious liberty really mean to someone like Alito? Well, I'm assuming he thinks it's shocking that a little boy doesn't know Jesus died for your sins. He doesn't know what the cross is about. He's not saved. I mean, the yeah. Catholic teachings are that if you're not saved, this is where you go when you die. I mean, he seems to be in a Catholic, arch-Catholic bubble. He sees everything through his Catholicism. And yet he took an oath of office to uphold and defend and support our secular Constitution. But he was talking at Notre Dame in Rome, pretty close to the Vatican. I mean, it's, well, so he's, he's such, tailoring. He's showing his true colors, yeah. as our title shows. But I wanted to ask um, that phrase he made at the end: um, "Religion deserves special, special treatment." Treatment is that true? Does religion deserve a special treatment in our country? Well, um, 
uh, our constitution certainly treats it differently, uh, differently right? Yeah. Um, and so uh, religion is singled out uh, for special treatment, both uh, in terms of protection and restriction on how it can interact with our government. Um, so yeah, the, the founders uh, of our country certainly wanted a country where you are free to believe what you want to believe, which was something that wasn't always true, uh, and they, they were escaping uh, when they came over here and founded the United States. Uh, but they also wanted a country that itself was free from religion in terms of how it governed. But does it mean in his mind that religious people are special in the sense that they're above the law? Well, in Alito's mind, it certainly does, yes. And we've seen that time and again in the cases that the Supreme Court has taken recently, where um, the, um, the religious right is taking cases now where they want the, um, all the benefits of uh, being uh, in this special status of a religious group, right? They want the tax exemption, they want uh, to be able to get government benefits, um, they want to you know, be able to run uh, uh, adoption agencies and things like that with uh, government money, but then they also want special treatment. They want to be able to discriminate. They want to be able to dis discriminate. And, and, and same with the main voucher case where those schools that were suing, or the people were suing to get into those schools, wouldn't allow you to be LGBTQ or could, you know, fire you if you were an unwed mother or that kind of thing. Right. The same, the, they, they don't want an equal playing field. They want an equal praying field. <laughs> but, um, well, so now we have another clip. Can I quote you on that? Uh since I had the honor this term of writing, I think, the only Supreme Court decision in the history of that institution that has been lambasted by a whole string of foreign leaders <laughs> who felt perfectly fine commenting on American law. One of these was uh, former Prime Minister Boris Johnson, but he paid the price. <laughs> Post hoc ergo propter hoc, right? <laughs> but others are still, yeah, are still in office. President Macron and uh, Prime Minister uh, Trudeau, I believe, are too. But what really wounded me, what really wounded me was when the Duke of Sussex addressed the <laughs> United Nations and seemed to compare the decision whose name may not be spoken with the Russian attack on Ukraine. Where to begin? This part was the most reprehensible to me. I, I mean, bragging about the Dobbs decision, which has thrown our nation into chaos and so many lives into crisis. You know, we see this every day, what's happening. And uh, so th is this the right temperament for a Supreme Court justice? to be making these kinds of comments about world leaders. Uh, you know, this comment is if uh, Boris Johnson got his just desserts because he dared to criticize Alito, which had nothing to do with, of course, his resigning. Of course, he was kind of winking, like, this is a joke. You know, well, he was sort of, to that audience, he was kind of playing up that. But to us, that sounds reprehensible, doesn't it? Well, I'm so glad that world leaders have criticized the Dobbs decision, and we, we need the world censure. Um, because we're going backward fast in this country. Yeah, which is really what the criticism amounted to from those world leaders is that, wow, this is a huge step backwards for the United States. And um, people uh, all over the world should be concerned yeah, about that direction. And shocked, yes. Um, and so that, you know, it's, in the sense that that's criticism, it's, it's well-deserved. Uh, and yeah, I, I do think uh, Justice Alito was, uh, was uh, being a little flippant. Yeah. Yeah. I also am reminded of Linda Greenhouse, who is um, the Supreme Court observer for 30 years for the New York Times and still writing columns. And even last year, she singled out Alito for talking about his politics of grievance. And she's written about that again. There's this uh, chip on his shoulder that comes through, not just in this speech, but in his decision making. There's even a chip on his shoulder in Dobbs, where they have a 6-3 majority in his favor. He has won by declaring uh, 
abortion to no longer be a constitutional right, and yet he still got a chip on his shoulder. You know, that just—it's the temperament. Is this the right temperament for a Supreme Court justice? A question we also asked about <clears throat> Kavanaugh. Yeah. We have more than one uh, justice who doesn't seem to have the right temperament. Yeah, Justice Alito comes off as uh, indignant and, um, you know. Angry. Angry in oral arguments, certainly. Uh, and uh, it <laughs> that contrasts oddly with his claims that uh, Christians are persecuted in this country, right? Uh, here's a, you know, uh, straight, able-bodied white man who has never suffered a day of persecution in his life talking uh, about, woe are the Christians in this country, you know, uh, this country where um, I think 88% of the current Congress identifies as Christian uh, over, you know, compared 70 to... 70% of the population nominally, of, yeah, that's right, uh, nominally actual, Christian, yeah. tax-exempt churches on every other corner. Right, where, you know, se seven Supreme Court justices are Catholic or raised Catholic, uh, one Protestant, one Jewish. Uh, like, the, the, this is a country where the those in power don't represent the demographics of the country as a whole anymore. Yes, they're over. One Christians in four are, are overrepresented by by a huge chunk. And then he had that snide remark in the decision, the Dobbs decision, saying something like, uh, "You can't accuse us conservatives of being ideological here. We're just looking at the pure law. It's you liberals who are the ideologues who want to try to force your agenda on the world." He said something like that in the in that opinion, and Linda Greenhouse says, "Well, that falls under the legal definition of, give me a break." <laughs> well. well, here's another um, clip from that speech. If we are going to win the battle to protect religious freedom in an increasingly secular society, we will need more than positive law. Think again of the ten-year-old boy I saw in the Berlin Museum. Think of the increasing number of young Americans whose response when asked to name their religion say none. Think of those who proclaim that religion is bad. What can we say to such people to convince them that religious liberty is worth protecting? So again, over and over again, somehow non-believers are the villains and the enemies or too dumb or somehow need persuasion that we need religious freedom when, uh, you know, the earliest people to, um, for the most part, to ask for religious freedom were dissenters, the unorthodox, Quakers, non-believers. So he's rewriting history here and making us look like we are the problem. Yeah. Uh, Alito also has it exactly backwards. Uh, he, he's asking the question, what do we say to convince these people that religious freedom needs protection, when what really like we all we care about are actions, right? You're free to believe what you want. Uh, it's right. how you act and how you handle yourself in this pluralistic society that matters, yeah. right? Exactly. Uh, and those who are trying to use their religious freedom as a cudgel uh, are discriminating against LGBTQ plus people, against women, uh, and. And, and other groups to come, right? Uh, the uh, um, the abortion decision uh, has an alarming uh, concurrence in it, where uh, Justice Thomas uh, signals that uh, this is just the beginning. Well, we know that's the case. Did I hear that right? When in his talk just now, that he's equating the nuns, N O N E S, with anti-religious, because not all nuns are anti-religious. I mean. I would consider myself to well, be... Well, he said hostile to religion. Hostile? I'm hostile to religion and government. Yeah, I'm <clears throat> hostile to this uh, new abuse of religious freedom uh, as a license to discriminate. Uh, it's a terrible idea uh, that uh, has never been uh, how the country has viewed the free exercise clause in the Constitution. And also, I mean, as a feminist, I am hostile to re patriarchal religions that are telling women that were second-class citizens, were um, sin-inciting, uh, you know, the typical um, second-class status that patriarchal religions uh, land women in. So there's reasons, it just if re religion's encroaching on our lives, there's reason to be hostile to it. We can also be anti-teachings of the Bible. I mean, the God of the Bible is genocidal and patriarchal and infanticidal and, uh, and on and on. So we can be anti-religious. Alito believes in a book that has 
silly stuff in it, a talking snake and a seven-headed dragon and people walking on the water and the sun standing still. I mean, I am anti-religious in that sense because that's just ridiculous, you know, and and in America, we should be free to say that. Yeah, but, but that's also not the pushback that Alito is reacting to here, right? He is reacting, he, he's saying it's a bad thing for us to react to action, right? Uh, it, and yes, uh, it's religious action, religious discrimination that's motivated by religious belief, but it's the acts that matter here. Uh, and, and that's what uh, is getting pushed back now. And so when he says, oh, how can we convince them that yeah. you know, this religious discrimination is okay? Um, like, no, that, that's the wrong question. Don't do the religious discrimination. Uh, have, have your actions speak louder than your thoughts. So is he proselytizing us? <laughs> well, I think so. Or he's he's denigrating us yeah. and thinks we should be proselytized. Now we have another clip. Our hearts are restless until we rest in God. And therefore, the champions of religious liberty who go out as wise as serpents and as harmless of doves can expect to find hearts that are open to their message. So when I read when I read that originally, I or heard that I asked Dan, "What Bible verse is that?" And well, he's obviously preaching there at the end. I mean, that's like a little sermon. But uh, uh, wise as serpents uh, and harmless or gentle as doves comes from uh, Matthew, the tenth chapter, where Jesus was instructing his disciples. He's saying you're, you're supposed to go out and convert people. And there's that famous verse before that where he says, if, if the city doesn't receive you, shake the dust from your feet and go on, because that city is going to suffer the, the harm of Sodom and Gomorrah, doesn't it? Day of do judgment. We have, do we have yeah, it there? We have if anyone will welcome you, listen to your words, um, it would be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. And then what is he going to say? I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. So what? Are we the wolves, I guess? Yeah, or or non-Christians are wolves. <laughs> Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes or wise as serpents and as innocent as doves. Well, I don't know how many of these proselytizing believers are dove-like in their attitudes. They seem to be very pushy, don't they? But so when you look at the context of it, it's all about... Christians being persecuted by non-Christians who are like wolves. And this is a Supreme Court justice believing this. So, you know, it'd be fine if he was serving on a Catholic court, but he's on the U.S. Supreme Court where he's supposed to um, dispense equal justice under the law. And how could a non-believer or, frankly, a, any non-Christian feel like we are going to get fair shakes before him if we go before him on our issues? Obviously, we will not. And why didn't he quote the Quran or the Bhagavad Gita? Or why didn't he quote Robert Ingersoll? Why is he just picking his... The religion that he was raised with seems to be his guiding metaphor in life. Any yeah, other you, thoughts? It, I'm just, it, it's really clear from these comments that Alito has uh, drunk the Kool-Aid, so to speak. Uh, he he uh, firmly believes in all of these uh, evangelical religious right talking points about how Christians are persecuted in this country. None of it uh, is based in reality at all. I mean, you, the, the types of cases that the Supreme Court's taking uh, from these uh, religious right evangelical groups, uh, these Christian nationalist groups, uh, are, are silly, right? The, the kind of discrimination they're facing is, oh, I can't, uh, you know, operate a cake shop that doesn't you know, uh, yeah. equally serve uh, gay weddings. Like, like that's that's not discrimination. Or I have to fill out a form on the birth control for the insurance, you know. That's, so that's that, a burden yeah, on so my... Yeah, so that the government will take over our duty to provide employees with birth control. Yeah. Mm. These are just the realities of operating a public business in a pluralistic society. And it's not a big ask. Uh, and the fact that Alito sees it as persecution is uh, truly telling uh, for, for how far gone he is. And I think you were right, Dan, that he's, it's good, he's, I guess, that he's paying attention to the changing demographics that three in 10 um, American adults now identify as having no religion, atheist, agnostic, or no, no, no affiliation. And, um, but he is seeing that as a threat to our country and a threat to believers. And I think he sees 
hostility to religion as anybody who rejects religion. Yeah. You know, that we're hostile. It's like Jesus. What did he say? You're either mm. hot or cold or I'll, I'll spew you out of my mouth. And he said, if you're not with me, you're, you're against, against me. me. That's the kind of small town talk that a local Messiah figure would say, you're either with me or against me, you know, that, and not, not realizing that there's a huge swath of the country that can be just totally neutral on these issues. But. Well, I think that we can see that we have a big problem when Alito was the lead writer in the Dobbs decision overturning Roe versus Wade. We now have uh, the Supreme Court captured essentially, I think, for Christian nationalism. Um, we have Trump having appointed three of them, we have Roberts losing his center, and we are in trouble, as we have been warning for some years, and this is why we truly need some court reform. Um, any other comments before we take questions? No, uh, why don't we go I have a comment, oh, wait, yeah, wait. That's oh. right, we do want to say one more thing. Speaking of changing demographics, speaking of the way the country actually is, look what just happened in Kansas. Yes, thank you, Kansas. Uh, which yesterday voted um, uh, against this anti-abortion referendum um, that would have allowed the legislature to adopt a whole series of, of bans and restrictions. And the people spoke in Kansas. It was... It was um, Almost 60 percent? Yes. 59 percent? And the Catholic Church spent millions and millions. We're talking about 12 million, maybe um, I've heard different things, but... Um, it was very clear who was wanting to change that law and the money that they were spending. So that's one in the eye for you, Justice Alito. You said you wanted to turn this back to the states, and this state said no. Hmm. So that was a wonderful moment. But it will be a constant fight. It will be nothing but fights like this. They'll be back in Kansas with more attempts to change referenda. We have lost abortion rights right now in Wisconsin and in at least... Uh, I hear between 12 and 17 states, and the prediction is in soon in half the states. This is a crisis. Yeah. Thanks certainly. to him. All right. Well, so, well let's, let's see what comments. Let's turn have. and see what our uh, our viewers uh, have to say about Justice Alito. Um, let's see. So uh, Melissa Hani uh, or Hani uh, asks, uh, what can be done to broaden this oversight? And uh, that's the entirety of the question. Well, I think that uh, there's the uh, Ethics and Transparency Act that mm. we are supporting, that our uh, um, Mark Dan, our lobbyist in Washington, D.C., is supporting, because right now the ethics laws do not apply to the Supreme Court justices. For example, if you ask to recuse them and you have evidence of their prejudice, it's up to them. There's no requirements. So that would be one way to go. That's not going to help. With Dobbs, but it would, you know, m perhaps make it easier to go after Alito for making these prejudicial comments in, in Rome. Should we have a case come before it on, on non-believers? But really, isn't the mask off already? And the mask of impartiality on the court is pretty much politicized. And are, is the court going to care if someone doesn't recuse themselves? They're not accountable to anyone on that issue. Well, they're, going to, they're seeing their numbers, their popularity plummet. And, of course, Roberts, as Chief Justice, has cared about the legacy. He's looking at history, but the rest of them just look at power right now. They've got it, and they're yeah. going to do what they want with it. That ties into uh, one question we have here from Robert Hunter, who uh, asks, how do we pressure John Roberts into enforcing a strong code um, of Supreme Court ethics? Well, I think that this, this uh, new bill that's been introduced is... Uh, if it would be passed in Congress, it wouldn't even be up to John Roberts. Um, certainly, he probably has some, um, I'm not an expert in this, he probably has some uh, prerogative. We have asked Roberts, for example, to investigate the fact that the Family Research Council says that it's been praying regularly with Supreme Court justices before the pandemic, bragging about it, going into the Supreme Court to pray. We have not had a response to our letter to... <laughs> Um, Justice, we we see Justice Roberts, response, but yeah. I mean, you, we can still ask yeah. and and also expose these. But don't you think it's, it's, it's obvious that some or most of the justices are paying attention to the news? They're looking at demographics. They're seeing the shifts. They they see the change in gay rights, for example, and 
Don't you think that just that public pressure, the public comments, the marches, the protests, do you, does that make any difference to the court? Well, I, I mean, we have to keep it up. But maybe it's just going to create a backlash, given their mindset, huh? Yeah. Uh, historically, the Supreme Court uh, has uh, been persuaded by uh, public discourse, uh, but it's always the last to change, right? It's a it's an inherently regressive institution. Uh, so it's only when public opinion firmly shifts in one direction that the court uh, well, will recognize that reality. Public, I mean, I, I think it has firmly shifted in that direction. It's just that we basically have minority rule. We do. We have um, minority rule in the Senate with the filibuster. We have minority rule in a state like Wisconsin, where we have Gerrymandering, that means that there's a minority rule in our legislature. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is happening all over the country. So, um, you know, whether the majority of people believe in abortion rights is no longer just the issue. It's can we vote that way? Is our vote going to count? Yeah, and that's the danger with uh, letting, I mean, Christian nationalism is not a popular perspective uh, in this country, even amongst the religious. But, um, but it's overrepresented. It's far overrepresented and now seems to be um, the predominant view on our Supreme Court. That's um, right. It's scary. It is very scary. All right. So uh, next question we have. Uh, well, this is more of a comment from Leora Satter. Thank you for uh, submitting your comment, Leora. And here I was thinking that the Supreme Court was supposed to be apolitical and a religious and to work toward the common good. But Alito treated serious issues like it was nothing uh, but material for his stand-up comedy routine. Yeah, yes, very good comment. Yeah, um, uh, and I, I don't, I don't think he's hit a tight five yet. I didn't find anything funny in there. No, really. and also laughing at the expense of all of this pain and suffering that he's inflicted, and you know, even he had to know about that case of the ten-year-old rape victim in Ohio who was nine when she was raped having to cross the lines in Indiana to get an abortion, and now Indiana is debating a ban, and we have the doctor being persecuted by the attorney general in Indiana, who's undoubtedly a religious fanatic in this Bible Belt state. I mean, just that case alone you could, is heartbreaking yeah. and doesn't matter. But you could see from those clips that Alito was speaking to a particular audience, and that audience was laughing along with him. So in, in the pure technical sense, he gave a good speech to that audience, which is what they wanted. That's why they invited him there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have a, a couple other comments. Uh, Diane Roden asked a similar comment uh, to Leora about, um, about the political nature of the speech. So since when do members of the Supreme Court give political speeches? Is this a normal thing? Um, I can speak a little bit uh, to that. Uh, it's certainly normal for them to give speeches. They all do uh, circuits talking uh, between uh, court terms. Uh, and it's also supposed to be um, frowned upon to get political in, in the sense of in endorsing a political party or certain uh, positions, especially uh, on issues that might come before the court in the future. Um, but uh, the justices are self-regulated in this. Yeah, so who makes the rule, right? What you right. can and can't say. But I did think that his dissing world leaders was very bad form. Yeah, um, right, Cer certainly not tasteful. Yeah, right? I mean, he didn't say, if he got up and said, vote only for Republicans in, in 2022 and 2024, that would be really beyond. Mm -hmm. He didn't go that route, but. Right, but also um, the, this is uh, all about norms, right? Uh, it's what the justices self-impose as norms right now. So uh, that's sort of, if we want to get down to brass tacks, I'll, I'll let uh, Ann Benedictson ask it. What kind of court reform do we need and how do we go about making it happen? Any court reform <laughs> at this point would be fine with me. I, I think that maybe the term limits are what are getting more traction. I think they're harder because there is a reference to, um, I forget exactly how the Constitution, the Constitution puts it. The Constitution talks about uh, a life, life appointment. Lifetime. And they're saying, well, they could be uh, a lifetime judge and maybe they could go back to the appellate. I don't know if that will work. I mean, there are people suggesting that. Mm -hmm. Certainly the legislation that FFRF has been very early to support is Mondaire Jones's, Mondaire Jones's bill 
that was introduced um, last year to increase the court by four, which would be the lucky number of 13, because that would represent the 13 appellate districts, including the uh, military. Yeah. And um, they used to do that. That's in the 1800s. They had as many justices uh, in some decades as they had appellate. That make, kind of makes sense. Um, I have also seen uh, suggestions for two replacements because of the stolen seats. Uh, Mitch Garland's stolen seat when they wouldn't hear his nomination by Obama. And then the, uh, the uh, rushed uh, nomination of Amy Coney Barrett. Any of these things we would be happy with? Do we see momentum in Congress? Not really. Do we even see many organizations like FFRF asking for court reform? It just seems to be this untouchable thing. And we would love to see more conversation. A year ago, I was at a, a meeting with the, um, um, the coalition group, um, um, sorry, that all the civil rights groups belong to. And I was the one saying, if we don't do court reform, we can't hold Roe. I mean, it was obvious, it's, but But we couldn't look have what done anything at that time anyway. Well, no, we could have. We were out trying to get court reform. We were trying <clears> to get <throat> groups to endorse court reform, and we were responding to Biden's But isn't it still a problem wars. that the Senate is minority rule? The justices have to well, be confirmed. Well, yes, but you at least have to have some momentum. You have to have people signing on in the House, so you, you have to see enthusiasm, and they're all afraid of it. And Biden's commission was a no-nothing, not, do-nothing commission. It was never supposed to actually even suggest options. And they, you know, there were some dissenters on that, but they basically, you know, I think they said we can explore term limits. But I would be happy with anything. Yeah, I mean, so just for some context, um, there's nothing special about there being nine Supreme Court justices. Right. It has not always been that way. There used to be an even number of justices for a long period of time. So there's nothing you know, constitutionally wrong with uh, changing the number of justices, uh, though there are some other details that um, you do need to, to check against uh, the actual Constitution. Uh, and uh, for additional context, the entire federal judiciary is overtaxed right now, oh, that's completely right. overburdened. That uh, you, shouldn't even be controversial. Yeah, you have the lower so points. many judges that are, you know, on retirement status with basically still full caseloads um, because uh, the, the work <clears throat> Uh, doesn't get done otherwise. Um, so even if we don't look at the Supreme Court, but that's the big elephant in the room, even if we just look at the appeals courts and the federal courts, there haven't been any additions to them since it's been more than 20 years to 30 years, and their right. case has gone up 30 percent, the population has grown. So that isn't, it shouldn't even be considered uh, political. Yeah. So yeah, getting yeah. getting more judges uh, up and down the federal bench uh, would be um, beneficial to the system as a whole. There are other uh, types of court reform that um, have been proposed that would also help with some of the um, that huge burden on the system. There's um, one of the huge issues with the system is how much litigation is these you know multi billion <clears throat> dollar uh, corporations uh, suing each other over things where. Uh, the amount of money in controversy just makes it uh, incentive-wise that the litigation is, just makes financial sense, even though um, you know, uh, settling out of court, uh, if, if it was you or me uh, you know, uh, with a lawsuit for a much smaller amount of money, you know, obviously we would settle because uh, the court fees uh, and you know, the paying for lawyers becomes a problem then. Um, so there, there are these other burdens on the system that uh, should that, be addressed that need somehow. need reform. Yeah. Uh, and I understand why people are saying, well, if, if it's just going to be every time the court does a decision that you don't like, you add a justice. But I think it has to be, uh, there has to be some kind of um, solution for this inequity that or this injustice that Mitch McConnell imposed on our nation of not letting Barack Obama, the first and only black president, by the way, uh, have his nomination heard. Yeah. This was a total injustice, and it was for partisan political reasons. So if there's pushback, I mean, what did he expect? But isn't the solution to vote out those Mitch McConnells? I mean, isn't it the political... <laughs> well, you know? good luck. Yeah, in states where you're still allowed to, to vote. <laughs> yeah, um, and, and also those are lifetime appointments and they appoint young people 
So this is not just affecting us, it's affecting yeah. the next generation, possibly the next two generations. We have a real problem on our hands in this country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the three of us aren't going to solve it here right now, but um, as an action item for I thought that was those our who goal are watching, <laughs> uh, yeah, talk to your representatives uh, about court reform and express your desire yes. for court reform. The unease you have with minority rule um, yes. on our Supreme Court. Because that's the only way um, mm -hmm. that things are going to get better. Um, so that's it for questions, uh, by the way. So. so that wraps up today's show. And tomorrow, who, who's going to be on? Uh, that on radio? our radio show tomorrow, our guest is uh, Adam Latz, L-A-A-T-S. And he has a book out called Creationism USA, talking about teaching evolution in the schools. And if you haven't listened to Jan July's We Descent podcast yet, that features... FFRF Legal Director Rebecca Market and Attorney Liz Cavell, uh, as well as other secular women attorneys. That topic is the very timely Dobbs decision on abortion. So you don't want to miss that. Thanks for watching. Ask an Atheist. We'll be back next week at noon central on Facebook Live. <laughs> <laughs>